Welcome to Electro Online. Here we're going to explore the concept of Gauss's Law. What is Gauss's Law? Well, it turns out that the best way to describe it is to imagine this situation. If we have an imaginary sphere, so not a real sphere, just an imaginary sphere, and we place that imaginary sphere around a point charge, like right here, here we have a little point charge with some charge on it called Q, and then we just place an imaginary sphere around it, either with radius R1 or radius R2, it doesn't matter what size sphere. Then we can say that Gauss's law can be defined by the following equation. Now, of course, this is only true if the charge is placed right at the center of those spheres. If it's not at the center of the sphere, that's a different thing. But if we place it at the center of the sphere, we can then say that Gauss's law can be defined by the equation that the strength of the electric field times the area of the sphere, that imaginary sphere, the surface area of the sphere, is equal to the charge inside the sphere, Q, divided by epsilon sub naught. Now, E, the magnitude of the electric field, is the magnitude at the surface of that Gaussian surface. So if we make the surface larger, that would be the strength of the electric field here. If we make it smaller, the strength of the electric field here, of course, would be larger because you now you're closer to the charge. So the magnitude of the electric field would depend upon the size of the sphere, the size of the Gaussian surface, as we call it. So the sphere is known as the Gaussian surface. So along the surface of the sphere, that's along the Gaussian surface, we know then that the electric field will be directed perpendicular to the surface. So, we can see here that no matter where we look, on the surface of that Gaussian surface, again, it's just the surface of the imaginary sphere, the electric field will be pointing directly perpendicular outward from the surface. And so we can see that the electric field magnitude can be defined via this equation right here. A is the surface area of the Gaussian sphere, Q is the charge enclosed by the Gaussian surface, and epsilon sub naught is what we call the permittivity of free space, and is defined as 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12 Coulomb square per Newton meter square. Another way to think about it is that the number of electric field lines that are emanating away from a charge, of course, depends upon how much charge you have, but the number will remain the same. It's simply proportional to the amount of charge you have right there. So no matter where you draw the Gaussian surface, the number of electric field lines coming through the surface, pointing or poking through the surface, is going to be constant, no matter if you draw a small sphere or a big sphere or a really big sphere, it doesn't really matter. The number of electric field lines is going to be constant. So if the number of electric field lines passing through the surface of any size always remains constant, and we multiply the strength of the electric field at the surface times the area of the surface, well, that defines then the flux, as we saw in the previous video. The flux is simply the product of the electric field strength times the size of the surface, times the area of the surface. And so Gauss looked at that and said, okay, if I put a surface around a charge, and it doesn't matter how big or small I make the surface, the number of electric field lines will always be constant, meaning the flux through the surface will remain constant no matter how big or how small I make the Gaussian surface. I can then say that the product of the electric field, the magnitude of the electric field, times the area of the surface will be proportional to the size of the charge inside. If I make the charge bigger, I put more charge there, there'll be more electric field lines. If I make the charge smaller, there'll be less lines. So the amount of flux to the surface will depend simply on how much charge I, I put in there and nothing else. The only thing left to do is to come up with the proportionality constant, and that turned out to be the permittivity of free space. And so to turn this proportionality into an equation, he had to define the charge inside the surface by epsilon sub naught, the permittivity of free space, and that gave him then, basically, this is then known as the Gauss's law. Now, sometimes we cannot write Gauss's law quite that simple. Sometimes it's written more in this integral format where we have to integrate the electric field dotted, this is a dot product, with a small area element, 
and that is equal to the charge inside divided by epsilon sub naught. But typically, for our purpose, this integral right here will usually end up being the magnitude of the electric field times the area of the loop. That is, again, provided that you place a charge right inside the Gaussian surface at the center, that the electric field points perpendicular to the surface everywhere that it emanates to the surface. That's really important. And if those two things are correct, you put a charge in the center and the electric field has the same magnitude and always points perpendicular along the, the, the surface of the Gaussian surface, then this equation turns into the simple equation that the magnitude of the electric field times the size of the Gaussian surface equals the Q inside divided by epsilon sub naught. That is a really handy equation, a really handy law to know because it allows us to solve for a lot of these problems that otherwise would be much more difficult to solve without Gauss's law. And we'll show you all, all kinds of examples of how that's done. But now that you understand the concept of electric flux and then seeing how that's then used in coming up with Gauss's law, now you're ready to solve all kinds of problems. Before we do that, we'll show you some more examples of how to deal with this but you'll like it once you get this understanding. And that's how it's done.